We are so pleased to be here tonight sponsoring the annual Parkinson's Neurology Lecture in association with Drs. Ali and Alex Rajput and would like to thank Drs. Rajput for their role in uh, making this evening possible. I would like to ask Dr. Alex Rajput to introduce our speaker for tonight. Thank you. Jennifer's just supposed to fit in like that. Does this work? Okay, great. Well, thank, thank you for that. Um, the tremendous turnout this evening. Can you hear me? It's working? Okay. Great. Well, it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Holly Schill. Dr. Schill has a background in electrical engineering and then went on to medical school at the University of Arizona in Tucson. She completed neurology residency at Barrow Neurological Institute in Phoenix, followed by a two and a half year fellowship with Dr. Mark Hallett in the human motor control section at NIH or National Institutes of Health in Bethesda, Maryland. She's currently the director of the Christopher Center for Parkinson's Research at Banner Sun Health Research Institute in Sun City, Arizona, and is research associate professor in neurology at the University of Arizona College of Medicine. She spends about half her time in clinical practice and the other half doing research. Her clinical practice is devoted to movement disorders and she follows many patients with Parkinson's disease. Her research consists of clinical trial work, longitudinal follow-up of patients, and collaborative basic science slash clinical research. Her research interests include risk factors for the development and progression of Parkinson's disease and innovative treatments for Parkinson's. She's received multiple honors over the years, including National Merit Scholar, Alpha Omega Alpha, or AOA, and Medical Honor, or Medical Honor Society, and the Fellows Award for Research Excellence at the NIH. I just looked uh, up her publication list on PubMed and she has over 100 peer-reviewed publications to her name. Dr. Schill has a Canadian connection. Her mother was born and raised in Alberta and she still has family in Alberta, Manitoba, and British Columbia. However, this is the first time to Saskatchewan. I wish to thank PSS for sponsoring her visit today and I would like you to please join us in welcoming Dr. Holly Schill. She presents to us on living well with Parkinson's disease, what research has taught us. So good evening, everyone. So thank you very much for inviting me. Um, thanks to both of the doctors, Rajputs, for, for inviting me. I really, um, really appreciate it. So, um, so as they mentioned, I am from a place called Sun City, Arizona, um, which is a suburb of, um, of the Phoenix area, Phoenix metropolitan area. It's a large retirement community, and actually a lot of people from the uh, Midwestern portion of the US, um, as well as uh, uh, quite a number of people from Canada. Um, come there um, to winter sometimes and then uh, sometimes end up moving there and staying permanently. Um, so the community is about 250,000 people now um, and everybody's over the age of about 55. In fact, the average age in Sun City right now is 77 years old. Um, it's a very active retirement community. Um, lots of um, centers for exercise, swimming, golf. Everybody golfs. Everyone drives golf carts around in Sun City. So. Um, so if you have any interest in when it gets very cold and dark here in the winters and there's, you're tired of, of pushing snow around, um, feel free to come visit us in Sun City. So, um, so I'm going to just talk to you about uh, a little bit about um, a lot of the research that we've done um, over the many years um, to tell us basically why do the doctors recommend what they recommend for you for Parkinson's treatment. So, um, um, and we're going to start first by um, just the kind of uh, symptoms of Parkinson's. So. Um, and I'm just going to start off by pointing out um, some of these um, um, resources for you. Um, uh, one of the best resources for uh, trials is clinicaltrials.gov, um, which is a, um, a resource uh, for uh, the National Institutes of Health, but it actually includes all of the clinical trials across the world um, that are recruiting patients um, for, with Parkinson's disease. So and I actually did a quick check before I came up here to do my talk. There's 1,075 uh, studies going on with Parkinson's disease. Some of them are active, not all of them are active, um, but just to give you an idea of the amount of research that's going on with Parkinson's. So, um, and then the Michael J. Fox Foundation is a, has been a big um, uh, resource for us in terms of uh, funding for some of our work. Um, there's a website called Fox Trial Finder, so lots of sources of information. And then I'll talk a little bit about a study called PPMI as we go here too. So, um, so here are some of the topics we're going to cover tonight. Um, 
I'm going to start first with diagnosis and prognosis, and then we're going to talk a little bit about the medications and why we use what we do um, for treatment, so kind of the currently available medications. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit what are the unknown needs, um, unmet needs, and what, you know, what we're trying to do about them. Um, we'll focus a little bit, too, on non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's um, that are becoming increasingly um, better recognized, uh, and, and we're starting to actually do some research on that. So um, most of you probably are aware that uh, most of the medications we use to treat Parkinson's modulate dopamine in some fashion. They either replace dopamine or um, augment it or block the breakdown or, or, or something along those lines. And so... Um, and so we've, we're, we're pretty good with dopamine now, but I think there's still a lot of work to be done on some of the symptoms of Parkinson's. So, um, so we're going to start first by going through some of these um, areas of the brain and, and body that are actually affected um, by the changes of Parkinson's disease. So, um, so like I say, you've probably heard a lot about dopamine um, from your doctors and, and um, just kind of in your reading of, of, about Parkinson's disease, um, but you may not know all of these other, other little things. So. Um, so we have a large um, brain and body donation program in the Sun City area um, where people um, um, without neurologic conditions um, donate their bodies to science and then people with Parkinson's disease and Alzheimer's disease, a variety of cancers and that type of thing. Um, and this allows us to study, um, it's, a, it's a not only brain donation but also whole body donation, so it actually allows us to start to look at where does Parkinson's start. Um, um, does it start in the body? Does it start in the brain? Um, and what we've learned, uh, um, actually, over the, just the last maybe five years or so, um, is that Parkinson's actually does start, it seems to start in the brain or, or in the central nervous system. Um, we actually never see it in the body tissues at all without seeing it in the brain or spinal cord at the same time. Um, so it doesn't appear to start in the periphery. And, and you may have heard um, um, in some of your readings on, on Parkinson's um, issues about maybe uh, maybe we can diagnose Parkinson's through a biopsy in the colon or something like that. And actually, it doesn't seem that we can we that it starts in these outside areas of the brain. It actually starts in the in the brain or the central nervous system um, uh, first, um, and then can involve the outside um, uh, outside the central nervous system um, as well. So, um, so we're going to go through this kind of staging system. What we've learned is that actually Parkinson's starts in the olfactory bulb. Um, we're reasonably sure of that. So the olfactory bulb is your sense of smell. It's the part of the brain that actually par processes your sense of smell. So it's not the nose itself, but it's actually the brain's control of the sense of smell. So, um, so just as you get inside above the, above the nose there on the olfactory bulb. And the reason we know that is that we find actually a number of elderly um, people who um, die without any clinical symptoms of Parkinson's disease, um, and all they do is have the changes of Parkinson's in the olfactory bulb. Um, and so that's allowed us to at least hypothesize that this is the earliest place where we can see changes of Parkinson's. So um, and when I say changes of Parkinson's, I mean Lewy bodies. Um, you may have heard the term Lewy bodies. Um, and then this protein called alpha-synuclein that is actually contained in the Lewy bodies. So, so that's what I mean by changes of Parkinson's, that you see these proteins um, that accumulate in these different areas of the brain and, and, and the body. So um, the other place is the motor vagus nerve, and that's where people get symptoms of constipation. So um, the statistics on constipation and Parkinson's is about 60, 70 percent of people with Parkinson's will have constipation. By the way, for the olfactory bulb, it's almost universal that people have a reduction in their sense of smell with Parkinson's. Only about half of people are aware their sense of smell is reduced. Um, but if you actually do objective testing, you like do a little scratch and sniff smell test on people, um, you can actually pick up reduction in smell in almost everybody with Parkinson's. So, um, so constipation is the next most common area. Um, and there are studies actually um, showing that constipation can predate the diagnosis of Parkinson's by maybe 10 or 20 years. So it can be very early symptoms. So. Another um, part of the brain um, is the pontine reticular formation. That's where we get what's called REM behavioral disorder. Um, this is where folks act out their dreams, um, kind of fight in their sleep, maybe talk in their sleep. Um, and again, this can actually predate the diagnosis of Parkinson's. So before the tremors and the slowness of movement start, um, you can start to see these changes in, the, in, um, in uh, people's sleep pattern. That statistics, about 50 to 60 percent of people with Parkinson's will have REM behavioral disorder. It is more common in men. Um, at least that we recognize. So men, women may have it um, um, as common, but at least it's not as recognized as commonly. So the, uh, the men tend to have more of the vivid dreams. So um, mood changes is the next um, symptom. So um, um, people can sometimes get depression and anxiety maybe two or three years before they actually get uh, diagnosed with Parkinson's. So 
and that's not that uncommon it's maybe one in five that will have a kind of a significant clinical depression before they actually get diagnosed with parkinson's so um, and then finally, the area of the brain is called the substantia nigra, um, and that's where the dopamine neurons live, um, and those project up into the brain. So that's where you actually start to get these, uh, the symptoms of, of movement problems, so tremor and uh, rigidity, slowness of movement, um, where most of our medications um, currently act. So, um, and then the other areas of the brain tend to be a little bit more of a later stage thing. Um, but Parkinson's, the changes of Parkinson's can actually spread up into the cortex or the thinking area of the brain and, and be a, a cause of cognitive symptoms in people. So, um, and so we know these, these different areas of the brain um, um, get affected. And you say, my gosh, that sounds very scary. That my, it sounds like my whole brain is, is being affected. Um, and that's not true. These are very small, tiny areas, very localized areas that um, actually get these Lewy bodies um, and these alpha synuclein changes. Um, so there's something about these areas that are just very vulnerable to, um, to whatever causes Parkinson's. So um, they're just susceptible to the changes. So. Um, um, so, and then the next thing is, okay, can we, w some of the research that we've done is, is can you actually look um, outside the brain um, and find, and diagnose Parkinson's? So, um, um, so it's not very feasible to do a biopsy of people's brains to make a diagnosis of Parkinson's, to be absolutely sure. Um, and so we've been looking um, in the last few years to look for sites outside um, um, of the, um, outside of the brain um, where we could potentially um, do a biopsy and actually find these changes of Parkinson's. So. Um, and so here's some of the areas of the, of the outside the central nervous system now that actually are kind of the hot spots, if you will, where you can pick up um, um, fairly routinely pick up changes of Parkinson's. So the submandibular glands, a little gland that lives right here underneath your jaw, so submandible or submandibular gland. I mean, some of you can rub your finger there and feel it there. Um, and we, we've actually shown that about 80% of people, um, if we biopsy that, um, um, we can pick up the, the pathology, the uh, changes of Parkinson's. So, um, so um, very much like you, you might get a um, diagnosis, you know, if you a biopsy of a, a potentially cancerous lesion and it gets sent off to the pathologist and gets evaluated, um, well it's, it's looking like we might be able to do the same thing with Parkinson's disease. So, and why is that important? Um, um, I, I think as we start to develop therapies that really do have um, um, uh, that really do meaningfully slow progression of Parkinson's. Um, we want to be able to diagnose people as early as possible. So we want something that's a very definitive um, diagnostic tool. And if we can't biopsy the brain and get a diagnosis, um, then we want to be um, at least as close as possible. And so that right now the submandibular gland seems to be the most promising, uh, promising place to, um, to uh, look for changes. So. Um, the esophagus, the lower part of the esophagus is actually p uh, positive a lot of the time, um, but it's harder to biopsy that. Um, you have to do an endoscopy and then do put a needle through the, uh, the wall of the esophagus, so it's a little bit more tricky procedures. So same with the sympathetic ganglia and these little neurons that live in the neck. Um, they're kind of hard to get to. So, um, so anyway, that's, that's kind of the diagnosis aspect of things. So. Um, these are just some clinical studies. Um, so that was mostly pathology that I talked about, so what we see under the microscope. So these are now clinical studies um, um, analyzing that same sort of thing. So um, we've done these, uh, these different studies. I say we, these are um, kind of the Parkinson's community has done a lot of this research. So um, looking at the reduction in sense of smell, uh, the REM behavioral disorder. So all of these things have been followed, particularly in studies that, that do sort of aging studies where they just follow a large group of people um, you know, above a certain age and in our, our brain bank it's over the age of 75 and follow them until, um, until they pass away. So, and that's where you learn these, these things about what, you know, kind of predicts Parkinson's and um, what's associated with its progression. So, um, so that's some of the, the clinical data. So the next is biomarkers, this concept of biomarkers. So, um, so first I'd like to talk about what is a biomarker, first of all. Um, a biomarker is something that tells you about the underlying disease. So um, that tells you about whether the person has it, um, and then more importantly, probably um, how it progresses over time. So, and the way I like to think about it is like the cholesterol to heart disease. So, um, so 50 years ago, um, we didn't know that cholesterol, high cholesterol was a risk factor for heart disease, um, but it was following a large group of people over many years and just measuring all these bodily fluids and different things, blood pressure, all these different things, and that's showing that people with higher cholesterol were actually at risk for, for heart disease. So now we don't wait to people have a heart attack before we treat their cholesterol. We treat their cholesterol um, while they're healthy in order to prevent that heart attack 10 years or 20 years down the road. So. 
And so we're looking for that same thing in Parkinson's disease, something that tells us that that person either either at risk for developing Parkinson's or that they might be at risk for a greater, a greater rate of progression. And then we want to kind of treat that biomarker um, in order to show that we actually make an impact on the disease. So. Um, so we need biomarkers in Parkinson's. One, because we don't have animal models of Parkinson's that are accurate. Um, in fact, that's been a big failing of a lot of our clinical trials over the years, is that our animal models do not predict um, what happens when we put things into human beings. So. Um, the other thing is uh, Parkinson's is a very mishmash of things. So some people have rapid progression, some people have slow progression. Some people have tremor, some people don't. Um, so there's a lot of var variability in how Parkinson's changes over time. And so if you're trying to do a clinical study on people, you have to get hundreds of people in order uh, to follow them over long periods of time um, in order to show that whatever um, pill or whatever you're putting into them is actually going to make a difference over time. And so we want to try to find something that sort of what's the common theme in all of these folks that they all have the same pathology. When you look at the brain pathology, it looks the same under the microscope. But so we want to find something that, that correlates with that pathology that tells us that's the basic biology of Parkinson's. So, um, so we need to figure that out so we can do better clinical trials. So, and then the final point is that our diagnostic ab uh, abilities are not perfect. So, um, in fact, we've just published some recent, recent things that um, um, show that we're actually pretty lousy at the first time we evaluate people in predicting who actually will have pathology in the brain. So, um, so our recent study actually is, is pretty disappointing. We, we were about 26% accurate um, um, in predicting who had the pathology of Parkinson's at the time of death. So, and this was just on the first visit we saw them. As we follow them over time, um, we watch how they respond to treatment and things. We get better and better at their, at their diagnosis. So, um, so we would use biomarkers then to identify disease, track progression, um, maybe define populations that respond to specific drugs. So as an example of that, some people with certain genetic forms of Parkinson's disease might have a, a treatment that is very specific to that genetic, um, genetic um, mutation or what have you. So. I mean, the basic thing from, from my standpoint is that we can do studies with a lot less money, so a lot faster, a lot less money. So, um, so to give you an example, we um, finished a couple years ago a study on coenzyme Q10 um, to slow progression of Parkinson's disease. Drug didn't work. Um, um, but it took us about five years to do the study and 800 people um, to do that study to show that the drug didn't work. So, um, and so I think if we had something that, you know, really tracked with progression and we could do that same study in, you know, maybe a year, six months, a year, um, and do it maybe in 80 people or 100 people max, and so really cut down the, the amount of investment. And this is what's holding up the pharmaceutical industry. They have been so burned in the par world of Parkinson's. They've been so burned by all of these negative studies um, that they're very reluctant now to, to invest in Parkinson's, um, um, uh, at least in drugs that slow progression. So... Um, um, and they want to see some of these biomarkers start to come out so that we can really make, kind of go to them and say, hey, come test your drug. We, you know, we really, we have a good way to follow Parkinson's and, and now I want you to invest in, 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 um, in your, you know, invest your money in, in, in this condition. So, um, so here's kind of a listing of some of the things that are, are uh, potentially biomarkers for Parkinson's. So, uh, uric acid, um, people hi with high levels of uric acid actually have slower progression of Parkinson's. So um, ur high urate also causes gout. Um, so it turns out that actually people with a history of gout are at lower risk for Parkinson's disease. So, um, so we're looking at ways now to potentially modify urate. Um, uh, there's a, a study on a supplement called inosine um, that um, is being looked at, a supplement that actually ra raises uh, uric acid levels. So. Um, vitamin D um, has been shown um, now to actually correlate with the severity of Parkinson's disease, so that might be something. Alpha-synuclein is that protein um, um, that accumulates in the brain of Parkinson's. It turns out we can, we can find it in the spinal fluid of people. Um, and um, right now it's looking at at least it helps us diagnose Parkinson's disease. We don't know if it... Um, uh, how well it correlates with progression as yet, but that's something we're looking at. So there's these imaging, um, DAT scan and AV133, these are dopamine imaging. Um, and I think they mostly help us at the time of diagnosis to be a little bit more sure that the person has a dopamine deficiency and therefore we're dealing with, um, uh, dealing with Parkinson's. So, um, and then we're doing, I'm part of this large study called the PPMI study, Parkinson's Progression Markers Initiative, um, where we got a 
a tremendous amount of people with parkinson's controls we've got people we think are at risk for parkinson's and when we're following them over time measuring every single thing we can every bodily fluid we take a sample of it and we're putting it into storage and testing a variety of different potential biomarkers to to see what does track with progressions so um so here's some of the thing some of the groups we're um um recruiting for um we're actually looking in the um um uh, con elderly control population, so people over the age of 60 to take smell tests, um, and, um, and if they, scan, uh, they have positive on the smell test, if they're reduced, um, then they come in and get a dopamine imaging scan, um, and if that's then positive, then we put them into the study and say those people may be prodromal Parkinson's. They might be people who um, um, don't show any tremor or mobility issues at this point, but may be at risk for, for eventually converting into Parkinson's. So. Um, we're looking for genetic people with genetic Parkinson's. So um, uh, it turns out the a group um, in the in the states um, um, that is a high risk for um, Parkinson's disease are people who have Eastern European Jewish descent, um, who also have a family history of Parkinson's. So those folks may be ab about 25% um, of those people actually have a genetic cause of their Parkinson's. So. Um, so we're looking at these kind of these groups that are sort of enriched for people who are sort of at risk, and we're calling this um, uh, uh, some of we're, sometimes we're calling it prodromal Parkinson's. So if they fit that profile with the sleep disorder and the low reduced sense of smell, but yet they don't have any tremors or mobility issues, um, we'll call that prodromal Parkinson's. So you might hear more and more of that potent, that term over time. That's starting to kind of take uh, take hold. So. Um, um, and so, so that's kind of it on diagnosis and, and um, sort of staging of Parkinson's, sort of where we are right now. Um, we're really just trying to get a handle on the basic biology of it. Um, and it, it's, it's kind of come a long way on what we've realized that our animal, our animal models, the things that we use to study different drugs and things have not been productive for us. So we've gone back to the human being, um, the human condition to really start to um, to look at it, and that's why these these aging studies um, and following people from you know the time of diagnosis all the way um, to the end of life um, are so important because um, I think the answer is actually going to come from from the patients themselves um, as to to what you know not only what causes Parkinson's but what um, uh, dictates its progression. So. Um, all right, so we're going to go through um, uh, medications here a little bit. Um, uh, and then this is kind of why we pick what we do in terms of the drugs that we use to par uh, treat Parkinson's. So, um, so first of all, I'm going to start with carbidopa levodopa. Most of you are probably on that if you have Parkinson's disease, um, or at least you've heard about it. Um, um, and why do we still use it? This is kind of the oldest drug, if you will, um, for Parkinson's. It's been around since 1967 when it was um, first kind of demonstrated to, to be uh, used. And, and in fact, actually, these original days, you know, they almost thought they had cured Parkinson's because it was such an effective treatment. Um, these people with fairly advanced symptoms then were treated with this drug and responded so dramatically. So, um, um, and then it became clear there were some issues. We're going to talk about those um, 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 fairly quickly. Um, but, um, but we've learned that it's not all about dopamine. That's one thing. Um, and then that do just using dopamine by itself has its limitations. It's a very short-acting uh, medication, and, and so it's always doing up and down in your body. It has food interactions and that type of thing. So it's not the, the be-all and end-all of treatment, unfortunately. So, um, so what do we know about it to this, today? You know, what, what can we tell you about this drug? So it still remains the most effective medication to treat Parkinson's disease. So, um, um, and that, that's just purely, you know, how much bang for your buck do you get out of one pill that you take? Um, how much improvement in your symptoms do you get with that drug? And that's what I mean by most effective. So even compared to everything else that's on the market. So, um, um, so there were some initial concerns that levodopa might um, actually be toxic to the brain. Um, so it turns out if you drip dopamine onto to brain neurons, it kills them. So, um, and so there was this thought that if we're giving people all this dopamine, maybe we're actually hastening the progression. So, um, but it turns out there's been a lot of research now into, into this aspect, and it doesn't seem to actually hasten progression. So um, unfortunately, neither does it actually slow progression. So, um, and so it's very effective at treating symptoms of Parkinson's, um, it reduces disability, it um, delays disability, it reduces the chance that somebody might, you know, trip and fall um, as a result of their shuffling feet. So, um, so it reduces the amount of disability, and most, uh, the amount of mobility issues that it has. Um, but it doesn't actually seem to um, um, actually slow the progression, you know, the loss of, of, of neurons over time. So, 
so that issue is so we think about it as a symptom treatment it's treating the symptoms but the basic biology of the condition is still there so we still need drugs that are therapies that slow progression so so it definitely improves morbidity and mortality if you look at untreated parkinson's disease you know more than fifty years ago now um, and there was definitely a, a shortening of lifespan, um, but now with treatment, and particularly with levodopa treatment, um, lifespan is essentially normal with Parkinson's. And so, and so it's important to remember how far we've come, you know, even though we're not perfect with our treatment, it's still a lot better than it used to be. Um, um, and a lot of the newer drugs, I think, have helped out as well. So um, there is, um, um, I, uh, one of the main issues with carbidopa is, is that uh, carbidopa levodopa is that's very short acting, and so most people take three times a day, sometimes more than that, um, um, to treat. Um, and so they're actually looking at a long, uh, long acting pro uh, product now um, from a company called Impacts that may be a more of a true cold, um, controlled release, um, the way it breaks down in the system. So that's um, one area of research um, that's. Um, um, that's um, I'm starting to really take hold is to look at therapies that are more sort of uh, just take one pill a day or maybe a couple pills a day type of thing and stay, instead of taking handfuls of pills a day, um, which unfortunately is, is what happens with a lot of uh, treatment for PD. So um, the other class of medications, so that's levodopa and the combinations of levodopa that are out there. And then other class of medications are called dopamine agonists. So, these drugs were developed um, because levodopa was so short-acting. So they were looking for something that mimicked dopamine close enough um, that the brain essentially couldn't tell the difference. So that's why these drugs were developed. So something that was long-acting, stuck in the dopamine receptor there, um, and just provided a long-duration effect. And so these drugs were all developed with that idea. Um, um, and they work, they do that. Um, they, they are generally longer acting drugs, so um, twice a day, three times a day, sometimes. So there are long acting versions of them now, so once a day formulations of them. Um, so it is a good way to develop, uh, um, uh, to deliver dopamine. Um, the problem is, is it's not as effective as levodopa um, in terms of treatment. So again, kind of bang for your buck, um, you don't get as robust a motor response with them. Um, but they do reduce the wearing off, um, so the, the on-off phenomenon that people get with levodopa, so where their medications kick in and then wear off and then kick in and wear off. They also reduce the chance of dyskinesia or the amount of dyskinesia. Um, so the dyskinesia, for those of you who aren't familiar, are these kind of twisty, fidgety type movements that people get as a side effect of levodopa. So they call them levodopa-induced dyskinesia because the drug, as it peaks in the system, can actually trigger too much movement. So you want to improve your mobility, but if we overshoot, um, then you get too much movement, so you get a, an involuntary movement as a side effect. So, um, so those drug, these drugs help to um, help to reduce that chance. So, um, you say, wow, that sounds great. Why isn't everybody on them? So, one um, is is that they're uh, they're not quite as effective as levodopa. So, people who have been experiencing levodopa and then maybe get switched to these drugs, go, well, this isn't as good. I want to go back to levodopa. So. Um, they can tell the difference. It's not as robust a response. So, um, and I think the main issue is actually some of the side effects with these drugs. So, um, especially in older individuals, so over the age of about maybe 75 or so, um, we really start to see a lot of neuropsychiatric side effects with these drugs, which would limit our ability to use them in everybody. So, um, so sleepiness, most people get some sleepiness with it. About one in five have problematic sleepiness. Hallucinations are more common. So. Um, um, so seeing things, um, compulsive behaviors, so um, um, this would be uh, like compulsive gambling, so um, that type of thing. So, um, so those, these drugs definitely fuel that. The reason they do that is they fuel the, uh, this, uh, uh, this dopamine receptor called D3 receptor, um, which is like your feel-good area of the brain. It's kind of your reward center, and so if you're always stimulating that, it makes you want to go do things that are, that are pleasurable. And so, um, so gambling, sometimes overeating, those types of things. So, um, so a little bit of D3 is good because um, um, that actually makes you feel good, right? It's a kind of an antidepressant, but then too much is a bad thing where you start to get those compulsive behaviors. So, um, so that's what the research has shown us with the dopamine agonists. So they definitely have their place, and you, you want to use them in people where you're concerned about wearing off and dyskinesias. So it tends to be um, younger individuals. Um, older individuals actually are at lower risk for wearing off and dyskinesia, which is just fine because then we can use levodopa in that population. So, and actually, so most people tend to be on a combination of if you're in the younger population. So I say, I say 75 is kind of my cutoff between um, um, old and young. Um, and that's because the average age in, in Sun City is 77. So I just kind of lump the lower half into the, <laughs> the young group and then the 
uh, over 77 in the in the older groups. So, um, so that that's the dopamine agonist. So the next category of medications are what are called the MAO inhibitors. So these drugs block the breakdown of dopamine. So and there's two, um, risagiline and selegiline. Um, these drugs are used um, in monotherapy, which means um, just by themselves in early Parkinson's disease, and they have very mild effects. Um, they're not very strong medications, but they have mild effects, and so sometimes they're used in people who just need a little little boost in their dopamine levels. So, um, and then they're also used as, as add-on therapy to people on levodopa, um, and so, um, so they... Um, um, reduce wearing off because they block the breakdown of dopamine, so they keep that dopamine around longer. So, um, and there are some studies on both azelect and selegiline that uh, suggest both drugs might have some disease-modifying um, uh, capabilities that they might actually do some um, to kind of slow progression. So, although that has has not yet been proven, um, but it's uh, it's an interesting idea, um, and I think. Um, uh, um, as as a, um, sometimes you know a, a goal, especially in somebody newly diagnosed, that you might consider these medications. So, um, and the nice thing about them is they're actually pretty well tolerated medications. So when we talk about all these hallucinations and sleepiness and all these things that happen as side effects, um, these ones tend not to do that quite as much. And so, um, so I think people kind of like them better. Um, they're just easier to use from that standpoint. So. Um, um, and then the CMT inhibitors are the uh, same idea as the MAO inhibitors. So there's two enzymes that break down dopamine. So, um, and so the other one is COMT. And so you, you can use intacapone or tolcapone. Um, th those drugs um, block that, again, uh, w reduce the wearing off of levodopa. So um, these ones don't work by themselves, though. You have to actually add them to levodopa. So, um, so these ones can't be used by themselves. So... Um, and they've um, actually they've done some study on uh, intacapone. Um, they, there was some thought that if you constantly stimulated dopamine uh, receptors, um, that you might actually slow progression. You just kind of gave a tonic level of dopamine in the brain um, that um, that might actually slow progression. So, um, and they've actually shown that that's probably not the case. Unfortunately, that if you use these this in too early in the course of Parkinson's, you just increase the risk of dyskinesia. So. Um, and so that's one thing we've learned in that class of medications. So, um, so they're used primarily for wearing off phenomenon. That's, that's the major use of those ones. So um, now some kind of more interesting, uh, interesting things, I think. Um, so that's kind of the dopamine system in a nutshell. So um, to talk a little bit about a drug called amantadine. Some of you may not even know this drug. Um, it's not used very commonly, but um, can be used. Uh, useful for tremor in Parkinson's. It has some uh, anticholinergic properties, which make it a, a, a fairly good tremor medication. So, um, and it's also the one commercially available drug um, that actually suppresses dyskinesia. So, um, and so um, that is the, so. If people are having that side effect of their levodopa, you can add amantadine. You know, say they you, they're having that side effect of their levodopa, but you can't reduce their levodopa. They just start moving more slowly and having more off symptoms. Um, so you have to bump up the levodopa again. You can always add amantadine to combat the side effects of dyskinesia. So, um, and we've actually um, been doing some research now um, at our sites, um, looking for a lo looking at a long-acting formulation of amantadine, um, which is better tolerated. So, and so far so good. It actually seems to be a bit better tolerated medication. So that's uh, that part is nice. So, um, amantadine um, can cause hallucinations, um, and so kind of we use it with a little bit of caution in older folks. So. Um, so it would be nice to have something that that had the nice benefit, but not the side effects. So, um, another interesting um, interesting study in the last few years is looking at um, a drug called Dinepazil or Aricept. That's a medication for Alzheimer's disease. So it was initially approved for Alzheimer's disease. Um, um, but there was a, a nice study done in Parkinson's disease to show that people with Parkinson's who didn't have dementia. Um, who were falling on a regular basis, so having regular falls, if they were put on denepazil, um, they actually had a reduction in their fall by a significant amount. It was, I think it was about s almost 70% um, in that population, so real significant reduction in falls. I mean, it was very interesting because it didn't seem to affect balance at all. People's balance was still rotten. If it was rotten to begin with, it was still rotten. Um, and it didn't overtly affect memory. These were actually people without any memory problems. So, um, but what they hypothesized when they looked at um, the group of people and looked at the results was that it was just actually helping people pay attention better. Um, and so they weren't as likely to you know, get up out of their chair and then s take a step or turn without thinking about where they were putting their feet and such. And so they were just less likely to tip over as a result. So, um, so the thought was is it's actually kind of helping, helping cognition in a, in a sort of subtle way and not overtly um, uh, obvious way, but kind of subtle ways. So, 
Um, some of the newer medications over the last um, few years, um, so most of what I've been talking about is, uh, has been on the market for quite, uh, quite some time. Um, some of the newer uh, medications um, are the extended release versions of um, ropinirole and, and um, um, uh, premipexil. So um, those are once a day um, versions and the ideas, they're not, they haven't been shown to be any better than the other ones, um, but they're just essentially more convenient and, and easy to use. And so particularly in people who are, are newly diagnosed, um, 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 they're, you know, they've gone from on uh, no medications to all of a sudden a diagnosis of Parkinson's and someone hands a prescription for three times a day for this and maybe once a day for this and all of a sudden they're on all of these pills. Um, it's sometimes nice to be able to just say, okay, here's a prescription for one pill a day kind of thing. So that's, that's the real advantage of these. Um, they really don't have a, um, a, a major advantage in terms of how they work. So. Um, Nupro or rutigotine is that skin patch. Um, um, that's a kind of long-acting formulation, so and that's kind of a nice option. Um, in the States, um, that's the only one that is um, uh, brand name only, and so we have a hard time sometimes getting it. We have to try the other drugs. We have to use the generic versions um, of the other drugs, so, um, so we don't use it quite as much as we probably would. So. Um, and then I put these last um, um, four um, drugs are drugs that are on before our Food and Drug Administration, our FDA, um, for approval. Um, for, and hopefully within the next year or so that we will start to see these um, get approved. So, and actually, droxydopa is, is actually been approved, and we're just waiting to see it launched. Um, um, but just to let you know, some of these drugs, there's a, the Ritery is that long-acting version of levodopa. Um, there's a thing called Duopa, and I don't. Do you guys do you have you done studies in in do a dopa at all or no? Um, it's an intestinal infusion of dopamine. So for people who have really rapid on-off, where they're you know maybe taking eight or nine doses of levodopa a day and every two hours type of thing, and I have a few patients like this that are almost taking medication around the clock. Um, this is an intestinal gel that actually goes directly into the um, intestine to deliver medication continuously. So. Um, it's, it's not everybody that's going to need that sort of therapy, but if you do need it, it's, it's, it's probably welcome therapy. So, um, Droxydopa is a blood pressure medication. Um, it's an interesting, uh, interesting drug that has just been approved in the, um, in the U.S., um, and they're just, like I say, getting ready to, to launch it for marketing. Um, it's a drug that raises blood pressure in Parkinson's. So about 30% of people with Parkinson's will have drops in their blood pressure where they feel faint. Um, um, and that's uh, what they call orthostatic hypotension, where they go from sitting to standing. Their blood pressure is fine when they sit, but then they stand and it drops significantly. And sometimes that can lead to falls and, and feeling poorly in general. So, um, so that's an, kind of been an unmet need in, in PD. And so um, droxydopa has been approved for that. Um, there's some interesting studies in, in Japan that have been done on this drug um, saying that it also may help gait issues, so it may help the freezing of the feet. Um, so for any of you who have that particular symptom um, where your feet um, kind of lock up and freeze, um, that can be a very problematic symptom, and this drug may help with that, although there's not been a lot of studies. So, um, And then the last one is this pimavanserin, um, which is uh, um, an, actually an antipsychotic medication, so it's for hallucinations. Um, and you say, boy, why would I need that? So about a third of my patients are probably hallucinating at any given time. So a lot of um, patients um, may have very low-level hallucinations and things. Occasionally, it actually becomes significant um, where it, um, it you know, is, is disturbing, interfering with their quality of life, interfering with sleep. Um, and right now, all of the drugs that we use to treat hallucinations, almost all of them have uh, the side effect of worsening Parkinson's. So they block dopamine too much in order, and, and makes it difficult to treat. Um, and so, um, so this drug has actually been studied specifically in Parkinson's hallucinations and shown that it is effective. So, um, and I think our, our FDA is going to, um, um, to uh, uh, approve it, um, although we haven't heard yet. So, um, so those are kind of the drugs, that are the old drugs, the kind of newer drugs, the ones just about on, on the launching pad, um, um, at least in our, our little world. Um, I talk a little bit about DBS or deep brain stimulation. So. Um, we have a, I have a, a fortunate, I'm fortunate to work with a neurosurgeon who does deep brain stimulation, so we're kind of in the same, not exactly in the same office, but right across the, the hall from each other, or across the uh, street from each other. Um, and so we have this uh, fairly robust um, surgery program for Parkinson's disease. About 10% of people with Parkinson's will um, uh, kind of meet the criteria for requiring or for needing DBS or deep brain stimulation. So. Um, and so how do you know that you might be a candidate for it? So um, it's mostly used for people who have significant on-off fluctuations, so where the meds are kicking in and wearing off, 
or significant dyskinesia as a side effect of their medications. So, um, so I typically, uh, my general approach is people who are taking more than four doses of levodopa per day, um, I, I start to tell them to kind of recommend, uh, to at least start to think about DBS. Um, it usually takes people about one to two years before they wrap their minds around having brain surgery for Parkinson's. So, um, so I start to introduce the idea and then slowly um, um, get them kind of, their minds wrapped around it. Um, um, but why do we recommend it? So um, the th third bullet there is better quality of life. So um, if, you're a, a, if you meet the criteria for requiring deep brain stimulation um, and you have it done, you will have better quality of life than if we didn't do it, if we just kind of did best medical management. We're pulling everything out of our pockets to try to, um, try to get the best control of your symptoms. So, um, so that has been shown to improve, improve quality of life um, significantly. Um, there are two procedures for Parkinson's. Um, one's called the subthalamic nucleus stimulation and the other's the globus pallidus. They're probably about the same overall. There's some reasons why we choose one versus the other. So um, side effects, the reason why people don't jump, everybody doesn't get brain surgery is there is a risk of stroke and infection and things by putting these leads in the brain. So fortunately, it's actually fairly low. Um, and it's in, um, in our center, um, we've been doing it for so long um, that we've got it kind of down where we, we, you, know, you know exactly what your stroke risk is and that sort of thing. And it unfortunately is, is very low. Um, our total side effects are less than 5%. So, um, so most people have actually a very good outcome. So um, the one thing I do counsel patients about is they, um, sometimes some mild cognitive changes that happen after DBS. So um, people sometimes have trouble getting words out, getting thoughts out. And so that can be a, kind of a frustrating side effect of, of having the DBS. So I make sure I tell people about that. Um, some other things, um, um, uh, doesn't slow Parkinson's progression, so, and you've kind of heard that theme, unfortunately everything that we use right now doesn't seem to slow progression. Um, although it does maintain its benefit, um, and for sure over five years, um, so people who've had DBS um, tend to still maintain benefit over five years, and then after about, they've even followed people out 10 and 15 years, some of the original studies, and shown that it still actually produces fairly good, uh, good benefits over time. So. The problem with it is, is that there's other aspects of Parkinson's that might progress um, despite that. So, um, for instance, if you're going to have cognitive changes with PD, this doesn't prevent that from happening. So, um, um, so sometimes you can get into uh, troubles with other things that kind of happen over time with PD. So, and I remind people too. Um, in our, our center, it eliminate, often eliminates you from treatment studies, and we do so much research on new drugs and new whatever um, um, to treat that, um, and if people are really gung-ho on participating in research, I just remind them that, um, um, that uh, the DBS will often exclude them um, um, just because it's such a, a confound in terms of how to deal with from a, a sort of statistics standpoint. So. All right, so that's DBS, um, and we're going to kind of go into more sort of non-motor things, non-motor approaches. So. Um, tai Chi, um, there's been some really nice research being done on, on Tai Chi. Um, and one study that was um, published in the New England Journal of Medicine um, showing that Tai Chi reduces fall risk by 67%. So, um, and this was compared to a group that um, was, uh, was stretching. So, um, so for people, and, and all you did was have to do it twice a week. So very, um, um, very kind of minimal, minimal effort on the part to really improve people's balance. And I think that's a significant thing. So Tai Chi is not very hard to do. So um, in fact, the, one of the kind of sponsors of these um, um, talks in our, our uh, area, the American Parkinson's Disease Association, is actually giving us a subsidy to provide um, classes um, in our center. So um, we have Tai Chi instructors who come in and do Tai Chi. So we have sort of a wellness program where I live. So we do educational things. We do exercise classes. We do Tai Chi. We do support groups all kind of in our, in our center there. We have a big auditorium like this, kind of all on one level, and we clear it out for exercise classes and things. So, um, so we have a lot of people exercising on a regular basis. So, um, so Tai Chi, um, and certainly um, if, it's, um, if you have access to it um, and, and do have some balance issues, um, and even people who don't have Parkinson's disease benefit from Tai Chi, so it's actually been shown to reduce falls in, in just uh, uh, it's over 65 populations. So. Um, this is my um, podium for getting to getting you encouraged about exercise because exercise has, has been um, one sort of non-pharmacologic way to treat Parkinson's. Um, and they've actually done a lot of studies to say that uh, um, exercise has almost as robust of effect as some of the medications do. So even levodopa, which is our uh, most effective therapy, um, um, people who exercise re re um, can reduce their need for medication. So. 
um, so I think it's a nice way to sort of augment what your what your medications are doing for you. So, um, and so here's some of the studies that have been done. I was just going to kind of summarize them all. So we know resistance training in, in Parkinson's disease improves muscle strength. We know it reduces instability. We know it decreases falls, and we know it improves quality of life. So. Um, and the quality of life is multifactorial. It's not just related to mobility, but it's also things like mood and how you feel about yourself and that sort of thing. So real, um, real important um, aspects of, of your of your day to day functioning. So, um, and by resistance training, I mean um, it has to be something where you're against gravity. You're moving. You're not just stretching. You're not just do. You know, I have people who say, "Oh yeah, I exercise," and they get out of bed and they go like this and they reach down and touch their toes and they do this and they say, "Yeah, I exercise." So that doesn't count. You have to. You know, either get on a treadmill, a stationary bike, go out and take a walk, um, um, do some, um, you know, resistance actual training where you're using kind of light weights. You don't have to be a big bodybuilder, but um, but does have to be something where you're exerting some effort, sweating, um, burning some calories type of things. So, um, so ro typical aerobic exercise all sort of counts. Tre uh, treadmill, cycling, um, walking. You pick what you um, uh, pick what you like to do. So. Um, and then stretching in PD doesn't work. That's actually been shown not to work. So um, if you think that's counting as exercise, it doesn't. So, um, and so likely some combination of sort of resistance training and aerobic uh, exercise is, is best. So um, when we do this um, um, class called Power Moves, um, it was uh, developed by a, um, uh, by a physiotherapist in um, Tucson, Arizona. Um, so she's a, a physical therapist who also ha has a PhD in neuroscience. So she's been really interested in looking at how, uh, the impact of exercise and kind of what's the best way to exercise. So she's developed these things called power moves. Um, and they're class, I, I should bring videos of it, but um, things where you start in a chair and then you jump out and you spread your arms out and you scream, yeah, and you, you know, really big movements. I mean, you do that multiple times until you're winded. So you maybe do 10 or 15 uh, sessions of that. So, um, so these are called power moves where you're making these big movements, um, um, very forceful kind of movements. So, um, and she's shown that that really does help um, improve function. So, all right, so that's my soapbox on, on um, exercise and PD. Um, finishing up, we're kind of um, winding down into the last um, um, topics here. So. Um, current motor research, so these are things for motor fluctuations and dyskinesias. Lots of different studies going on, and actually this is just sort of a sampling of them. Some of the, the ones I put up here are the ones that are a little bit further in development, so um, some of the different um, therapies. So motor fluctuations, that's looking at off symptoms. Um, dyskinesias, drugs to de uh, being developed for that. So, um, so that is um, coming along, and I don't want to spend a lot of time on all of these different therapies. So some of them we're studying in our clinics, and some of them are going uh, other ways. So... I told you I would talk a little bit about non-motor research because um, this is such an important aspect. You know, we give you your prescription for whatever version of dopamine that you're taking, um, but it's also important to a uh, ask the questions about how is your mood, um, how, you know, blood pressure symptoms, how is your thinking ability, your uh, thinking and memory, constipation, urinary issues, all these things that we know now go along with Parkinson's that they're actually fairly commonly associated. And we're now kind of starting, the neurologist now is becoming almost more of a primary care physician where we're asking a lot about other, other uh, aspects of people's life. So I always ask about mood. I ask about people's driving abilities and their cognition and their relationships with their families and, and all of that. So, um, so, um, so just kind of to go through these kind of quickly. So um, depression, they've done a lot of research now to say um, that there, um, it is important to treat depression and Parkinson's disease. Um, that people do respond to treatment, um, and that it almost doesn't matter what you pick. Uh, most of the antidepressants available do seem to work. They've studied a variety of different classes of medications. So, um, and so, and it is also an independent um, predictor of quality of life. So, if you're depressed with Parkinson's, you are going to feel worse than if you're not depressed. So, and depression is considered very treatable. So. Um, I want to just point out, um, uh, just because of the recent um, um, suicide of Robin Williams, I've had a lot of patients ask about that particular aspect in, in, in PD. I um, mean, it turns out actually that the, um, the risk of suicide in Parkinson's is actually less than the general population. So, um, so I think people were a little alarmed by this, and everybody was saying, oh, he had Parkinson's, and that's why he committed suicide. And, and that's really not true at all. Um, um, I think he had a longstanding depression, and, and then... Um, um, and then, you know, that was the relationship. So, 
Um, so anything, I hope that's um, um, sort of comforting for you all that that isn't a, seri a, a, a significant risk. However, the symptoms of depression can be um, uh, you know, fairly common in PD. Up to about 50% of people will have clinical depression. Um, and because it responds to treatment, it is important to identify it. So um, apathy is this concept of kind of uh, less motivation, less initiative to do things. Um, um, that is something we struggle to treat. We've been looking at um, using the dopamine agonist for that and so far have not really been successful. Um, the blood pressure medications we talked about, um, that's droxydopa. Um, cognition, um, the memory medications actually work better in uh, Parkinson's than they do Parkinson's disease than they do in Alzheimer's disease. So, um, so if people are having cognitive impairment with Parkinson's, it's important to kind of recognize that and, and potentially treat it. So, um, constipation. They've actually done some studies now on on drugs. What's the best drug for for treating constipation in PD? So. Um, you can ask your physicians about that. So urinary frequency, um, um, this is, um, there's a, a single study now on using uh, botulinum toxin or Botox injections into the bladder um, to treat urinary urgency. So, um, so I just mentioned it there because it's actually been studied in, in uh, people with uh, PD. So, uh, so just something to, to think about. So although I, not too many people are anxious to have that done. So, um, and then we talked a little bit about hallucinations. So. And finally, we're going to finish kind of what's on the future here. So um, neuroprotection. So we're, this is the unmet need that we were still working on. So we, we have studied a lot of things. We know what doesn't work, and that's the first list there of all these things that have been studied and doesn't work. Um, and then there's still a list of what might work. Um, and some of them are still in the process of, of studying is ratapine, inosine, some of these things, nicotine, um, people who smoke are lower risk of developing Parkinson's disease. So, um, so there's this interest in nicotine. So some of these other things. So um, some of these newer ones I've just added actually um, um, based on some research I did right before this talk. So. Um, so those are some of the things on the, on the horizon. And that's the future. And um, that's what we really need is this sort of holy grail. Um, uh, people say, well, when's the cure coming along? And I say, I don't know when the cure is coming along, but I'm hoping that we can at least find some things that really do slow progression. Um, because I, I have hear people all the time, if you can just keep it from getting any worse, I would be happy enough. You know, we'd like the cure, um, but if you can at least just slow it down so it, um, so it doesn't progress over time, um, I think that's what we would like to see. So. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on, on biologic therapies, um, uh, mainly um, because they're, um, they're still kind of in this researchy phase. There's not a lot of things that have been shown that are any better than what we have. So, um, but just to remind you of things like gene therapy, um, there's actually been quite a lot of research on gene therapy um, across um, the U.S. as well as the, the rest of the world. So. Um, um, so inactive virus is actually transfected and put into the brain um, to have a, an effect. Um, and it's interesting, you do gene therapy and it's like putting a little, little chemical, like putting a little pill right in the part of the brain that you want it to go in and it's just secreting a chemical. So, so it, sounds scary, it sounds scary when you first hear about it, but it's actually, um, actually not. And I'm not going to talk too much about stem cells. People always ask me about stem cells. Um, and, and there's just not enough research now to, to say whether we can even recommend stem cells, although there's a little bit of a, a push again to start to look at them again. So, um, so I think it's probably not too far in the future where we'll actually see studies again looking specifically at stem cells. It's, it's been kind of a lull, and now I think there's kind of renewed interest in it. So, so I'll finish here with my, my advice slide, and then we'll open it up for questions. So. Um, so what I tell people is to get on mailing lists for trials and, and participate, stay active in things, go, know what's going on. So um, get educated on the medications and, and know what ones to use. Um, um, exercise high intensity and often. Um, talk about your supplements with your doctors. So the uh, tendency in the U.S., and I don't know if it's the same, same up here, but um, um, in our, our group, um, people will, their neighbor will come over and say, hey, try this. I've heard it's good for Parkinson's. And they don't even know what they're taking. And they pay 100 bucks and, and, and take whatever supplement that their neighbor's giving them. So, um, so I think there needs to be some ca uh, caution about that sort of thing. So, um, so that's what I mean. Be careful of charlatans. Not that your neighbor's a charlatan, but there are people <laughs> who are, um, who are uh, very invested in their supplements and things and try to get everybody swayed on, on doing it. So. Um, so just make sure you're talking about them with your doctor. And it may be appropriate that some supplements are actually good. For instance, vitamin D we've talked about. Um, if you're low in vitamin D, it may, may really make sense to, to treat that. So, um, so that's it for the talk. And I will finish just with my um, um, contact information. If any of you would like to ever look me up, um, either by uh, email or, or coming, to, coming to Sun City and visiting us sometimes. So. 
Um, so I thank you for your attention, and I think then we'll do some, some questions. So, so thanks very much.